just in case you wonder what I think is important. What I also think is important to, is to have Margarita Mooney back on the show. We had Margarita Mooney on recently, and it was one of those things where we thought, this is ridiculous. We need to keep talking. Can you come back? Yes, you can. And she's here now. Margarita Mooney, welcome. Thank you, Eric. Great to be back. I've got to explain to people who don't know who you are. You are an associate professor of practical theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. And you are, uh, to my mind, more importantly, the executive director of the Scala Foundation. ScalaFoundation.org is the website, S-C-A-L-A. Tell um, my uh, audience, if you would, what, what is the Scala Foundation? I mean, I know you're at Princeton, but uh, what is the Scala Foundation? Scala Foundation is a nonprofit I started in 2016 because I had come to see that students often going to elite schools weren't really getting a classical liberal arts education. And by that, I mean students weren't being given the philosophy of the human person that allows us to integrate knowledge from specialized fields, as important as that is, integrate it into what Pope Benedict has called a humanistic synthesis. How do you bring all the different little pieces of knowledge and actually put them together to build um, flourishing lives and the common good? And there's a there's foundational ideas from the great texts, from philosophy, from, from theology, from natural sciences that help students to integrate knowledge. But also, Scala was founded because I wanted to help students discover their own personal calling or their own vocation with knowledge. To know something and to know what your calling is are very different things. And a good education is supposed to do both. It's supposed to help you discover your calling. Now, where, uh, I, I, I'm trying to remember, where, where you grew up, where did you grow up? What is your biography? I grew up in Frederick, Maryland. I was the fourth child, the only girl, three older brothers. And as I said on the show before, you know, when I was a child, I thought it would be great to become a warrior like St. Joan of Arc, because I had three older brothers and I liked that she competed and fought with boys. So I just knew I wanted to be competitive when I was young. And my competitive spirit got me into the Ivy League. But at some point after finishing my undergraduate at Yale and spending three years living in Central America, working with ex-combatants of the civil wars there, I knew I needed something other than a fighting spirit because I was working with people who had fought revolutions and I think both sides lost in many ways. What, at what point did you come to take your Christian faith seriously? Is that a lifelong thing or is that more recent? When I left Central America and went to graduate school in sociology, I was really, really humbled about my own power to change the world after my own image. And I was humbled about the power of, of anybody to fix the world. So I thought initially what I needed to do was just sink myself more into greater and greater forms of knowledge. But I had also seen human brokenness and human sinfulness. And I remember just, I'd always been Catholic and always believed in God, but I remember walking in to mass at the Princeton University Chapel when I was a graduate student and just being being overwhelmed with my own weakness and brokenness um, and knowing that I really needed God. So there was a moment when, you know, faith or going to church is no longer just checking a box, but a real acceptance of my own dependence on God. And that's not what I had ever heard or been told. And it would had been easy for me to kind of, maybe people tried to tell me and I didn't listen, but what was first and foremost always in my mind was climbing that next rung of the ladder. And if God could help me climb the rung of the ladder, I believed in God. And if God didn't help me climb the next right. rung of the ladder, I'd let go of God. I think Hitler had that kind of Christian faith. It's kind of funny, isn't it? Because you realize that until you realize that you can't do anything apart from God, you, you really don't know who God is. He's just, you know, uh, no. he becomes our puppet, which is to say he's not God. And it, it's funny too, because I think if you're successful, um, people tend to feed you this information, this idea that you can do anything, you're successful, keep going, keep going. And you have to s figure out yourself, no, I can't. At some point, I, I mean, for me, it was after I graduated from Yale, I realized, okay, I can get good grades and do this and do that. But what happens once I get past that, now what? Now what am I supposed to do? Even the idea that I'm supposed to find out what what the meaning of life is and who I am in it and all that kind of stuff, it's so daunting 
that uh, unless God helps you in some way, you are going to be lost. And so that to me, that's an honest place to be. So, but what happened to you as a grad student that uh, enabled you uh, to grab on to God? You mentioned something about an angel. I don't know if this is a good time to talk about that. Yes, that Princeton University Chapel has been one of the physical places where I feel like God has reached me directly multiple times. Frankly, most of the time that I'm praying or going to church, I just have my own thoughts going through my head and I'm not terribly recollected about what God is doing. But as I just mentioned, God told me that day when chapel and mass that I really needed him and I finally listened. And many years later, um, almost 20 years later, now as a faculty member at Princeton Theological Seminary, one morning, in this past May, 2019, at 7.30 a.m., I went in. And I like going to the chapel that early in the morning because nobody is ever there. This is is less than a year ago. Less than a year ago. Yeah. And that morning, I wanted to be alone, and I wanted to pray alone. And I got down on my knees in front of the tabernacle. They have a side chapel. It's a Catholic chapel, the tabernacle. And I was trying to pray to strengthen my young friend, John, my former student from Yale, who was very close to death. And I had been visiting him in the hospital and talking with him, and I had these hopes, as did he, that there would be a miraculous cure. And that morning, I woke up, and anyone who's ever lost a loved one has had this feeling. I felt like someone had kicked me in the stomach, and I knew his soul was gonna be leaving his body very soon. And I went to pray, thinking I could somehow strengthen him in his final hours. And all I could do was sob. I sobbed my eyes out, and nothing pious was coming out of me. All I was saying was that I was mad at John for dying, which makes no sense. He didn't want to die. It wasn't his choice. I was angry at God. This makes no sense. And I had this terrible feeling of just despair. Like, I can't go on. I can't go on because this young man had helped me start Scala. He was supposed to get his law degree from Columbia and be on my board. And now he was close to death. But suddenly I heard footsteps. And I thought, oh, gosh, some undergrad decided to get up early and walk in and they're going to find me crying and I just want to be alone. And I didn't look up. I would not look up at who it was. And suddenly someone knelt down and began to pray out loud, which, by the way, Catholics don't do very much. And this was next to you? Yes. In this same tabernacle? Yes. And he said, Heavenly Father, we lift our cries up to you today. And I stopped and I realized he was praying out loud, not for himself, for me. We know that you hear our cries and we turn our desires and our fears to you and trust in your merciful love. Heavenly Father, today, Please hear our cries. And I was startled, but I realized this person was praying for me, so I thought I should at least look up. And I didn't see a student. I didn't see anyone who worked at Princeton University. I saw a man about my age with jeans and a Yankees cap. Okay, John was raised in the Bronx. He ended up being buried in the Bronx. When I couldn't visit him in the hospital, I took myself to a Yankees game to distract myself. And so I looked at this man and I said, thank you. I'm praying because my my 26-year-old friend is close to death. And he said, what's your friend's name? I said, John Artunian. And he touched me on the shoulder and he said, I will lift up your friend today in my prayers. And at that moment, I believed that that was an angel who was going to help John to die in peace and go home to God. We're going to put a pin in it, as they say. We'll be right back with Margarita Mooney. It's the Eric Metaxas Show. Hey, folks, uh, today's uh, Monday, I think, which means it's Miracle Monday. What a surprise that we should be talking about angels. My guest is Margarita Mooney, Ph.D. She is uh, an associate professor in practical theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. And, Margarita, you've been telling us this amazing story of um, uh, about a year ago visiting this chapel in Princeton and praying and then having somebody kneel beside you and pray with you. It seems miraculous, but you're just about to tell us whether it is. So tell us uh, 
what happened? Well, I was startled but comforted by the appearance of somebody at 7.30 in the morning at Princeton University Chapel who seemed to know the exact words that I needed to hear. And who's a stranger to a you. A complete stranger, never seen him before, never seen him again. I go there all the time at that time of the day, and I'm telling you, there's never anybody there. But after the angel told me his beautiful prayer, knelt down beside me and prayed for me and told me he would be praying for my friend John, who I believed was very close to death. I was comforted in the sense that I wasn't alone and John wasn't alone, but I couldn't stop crying. I kept sobbing my eyes out even after the angel left. Now you say even after the angel left, why did you think, did you think then that it was an angel? I did because it was so strange and it was so perfect. It was so out of the place and I couldn't think a pious thought. I couldn't pray the way I thought I should pray. And then somebody comes in who I've never seen before wearing a Yankees cap and prays exactly the words I should have been able to say, but I couldn't. But here's also why I thought it was an angel. Because even though when he left, I couldn't stop crying, my prayer changed. And I felt my friend John speaking to me. And what he was telling me was that I had to carry on my mission because when angels appear to us, it's easy to say, oh, it's just, you know, soothing or comforting us. No, angels are messengers of God. And in that exact same spot, 15 years before I was finishing my PhD in sociology, thought I was at the top of the world, except I couldn't get a job, you know, typical academic problem. And I went to that chapel to tell God I would leave the academy and I didn't need to be an academic or a professor. I'd go off and take a job in international development. I'd been told 90% chance I was going to get this job. And I went there to tell God that I was giving up on my dreams to become a professor and go take this other job. And I kept hearing this voice telling me, no, your mission is in your work in the academy. And I kept saying, no, 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 that's not my mission. That's not what I want. And I couldn't get rid of that voice. The next day, I got an email telling me that job I had been told I was gonna get had fallen through. I sent an email to a professor who I admired and I said, I'm about to get my PhD. I don't have a job, but I'd like to work for you. He gave me the job. And I've been in the academy ever since. And part of the reason I've never left is because of what happened in that chapel. And then there I am 15 years ago, I've started a nonprofit. It looks like things are going up, but I have this terrible amount of responsibility. And now the student who helped me the so, most. So you mean 15 years later, right? I'm sorry, yeah. 15 years later. And I start to have this dialogue with my friend, John, who's about to die. And I hear him telling me that, yes, I can go on. I feel like I can't go on. I feel like I can't continue this work. I feel like I'm not worthy to do this work. I don't have the strength. I don't have the intellect. I don't have the spirit. But that visit from the angel was confirming to me that, yes, my young friend was going to die, that he was going to be okay, and that I had to go on with my mission. And it's very hard sometimes to accept that. And what my friend John, one of the last things he said to me but while he was still alive was that my problem was that I tried to do everything by, by myself. I tried to accomplish all these things on my own. And the angel appearing to me was affirming to me that I had to go on with my mission, but that I couldn't do it alone. I needed God, but I needed other people. And I felt not consoled in my pain over John's death, but I felt that in spite of my pain over John's death, I felt certainty that God had given me a mission and I could get up and pursue that mission, even in the midst of my pain. I, I just think it's so wonderful that, that you who are in the academy, especially at a place like Princeton, are willing to share so vulnerably um, your experience of faith, your experience uh, with what you believe is an angel. I agree with you. I, I believe it was an angel, but I know that there are many people that can't possibly imagine uh, that that could be anything than your own um, imagination, and uh, you know, who expect angels uh, have to have have to appear with wings and and so on and so forth, but. I've always wanted to, in a way, I guess, express the the breadth of spiritual experience, right? That mm -hmm. to, to, to say that God communicates to us in all different kinds of ways. And we do have a responsibility to discern, was this God? Was this something I ate? Was it my emotional state? Uh, was it the devil? You know, we, we have that responsibility. Nonetheless, uh, within the realm of reality, 
uh, is a great variety of spiritual experiences. And what you've just experienced, I know people who have told me very similar stories that mm -hmm. they have known it was an angel. And it's never the kind of thing that you can really prove. So uh, your, your, your willingness to share that I think is so important because there's so many people wondering, would God speak to me? And how does God speak? And, how did it, and it, there's a great variety, mm. but we need to know that he does and that he wants to. You know, Eric, I've taught classes in sociology of religion. I've taught classes in philosophy of social science. And I think it's important to hear people's stories about the appearances of angels because the dominant way of thinking about causality in our life is always vertical, right? We're perfectly comfortable thinking that our psychological state is real, even though we can't ever see it. And we're perfectly comfortable with unseen forces that we call capitalism or class having an influence on us. But what we don't realize is that our modern ways of thinking have rejected what ancient philosophy accepted and what believers have always accepted, that there's a kind of vertical causality. I understand people wanting to be skeptical about claims of divine intervention yeah. or vertical causality, but to deny that it could ever happen is deeply problematic and frankly goes against human experience. And we have to put on in fact, we have to put on philosophical filters to explain it away somehow and come up with explanations that make a lot less sense and really aren't very rational. That, that, it's funny you say that because I, I uh, in my book on miracles, I put in a number of these stories and I challenge people. I say, read these stories and you tell me what pretzel are you going to have to twist yourself into to explain this away? I mean, the Occam's razor explanation is this was divine. This was God. That's the easiest explanation to, to certain things to argue them away or to say it couldn't possibly happen. It's more difficult to get to that explanation. So it is important mm -hmm. that we put that out there. And when you say human experience, I, I think that that's valid as well. It's, uh, it's so important to say that human experience says there is a reality, a spiritual reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, just because it's difficult to uh, figure it out, you know, it's not like the periodic table. If we just spend enough time, we'll, we'll be able to figure it all out. It's invisible, but it's just as real as, you know, the atoms of beryllium we can't see. And we can, we can figure it out uh, from the effects, from these anecdotes, we have a lot of information if we're willing to see it as, as evidence and information. You know, Eric, sometimes I like to say that there are ideas from dead white men that I just can't subscribe to. And one of them is this idea that comes to us from philosophy, right? That if God exists, he's purely imminent and he's only acting through human actions, right? The idea that there's that if God exists, he's not transcendent and unbounded and unpowerful and omnipotent is a very strange idea. And in fact, to most of the people across the world and to most women who tend to have these spiritual experiences or the people I met in Haiti, right? My first book was about Haiti and spending time in Haiti and with Catholics from Haiti taught me how American my Catholicism was. And I think it's really easy to stereotype people with brown skin or dark skin going to charismatic services and clapping their hands and talking about feeling the Holy Spirit as if they're running away from the world. And that's a really unfair stereotype because I've spent time in these communities and people who see God acting directly in the world, what it does is it turns their hearts to gratitude and they're giving praise to God and they have a sense of mission. So again, this idea, another idea from dead white men that I can't subscribe to, that religion is the opiate of the people. Yeah. That somehow people who are praising God in the midst of suffering are running from their problems. Nothing could be further from the truth. We will return to the discussion of Karl Marx and faith uh, in just a moment. My guest is Margarita Mooney. Uh, she is the director, executive director of the Scala Foundation, scalafoundation.org. Check it out. We'll be right back. And I'm sitting here with Margarita Mooney, uh, who is an associate professor of practical theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, Margarita, I want to be clear. People can find you at scalafoundation.org, but also at margaritamooney.org, and it's M-O-O-N-E-Y, margaritamooney.org. 
margaritamooney.com. I'm sorry, margaritamooney.com. Um, we were just talking about uh, Karl Marx and how this this idea has come into the West. Uh, you can trace it back to the Enlightenment, and it, there are all kinds of ways, uh, pathways that this bad idea has come to us. But this idea that there is no transcendent reality, there's no objective truth, um, and we're dealing with that, and especially in the academy, the idea that you're at Princeton willing to, uh, you know, to, to be vocal about your, your own views on this, which I, of course, share, but it's, uh, it's a little bit lonelier than it might have been 100 years ago. Yeah, I was telling you that I teach a class on sociology of religion and I teach Karl Marx and he didn't say much about religion. He simply said that it's the opiate of the people. And so his philosophy is a purely materialistic philosophy and anything else is superstructure, is a human creation. So the idea of God might exist because we created it. But the idea of a transcendent God who directly intervenes in the world, he just outright says it can't be true and doesn't really do a lot of description of religion, but he does describe what he sees religion doing to people, which is subjugating them and preventing them from using their freedom to see who they truly are, and, right? And religion is alienation from oneself, according to, to Marx. But to be fair to Marx, there is an element of religion over the centuries that has been an opiate of the masses. In other words, not sure. all religion is good religion. And he, sure. of course, was lumping it all in together. But we do know um, that there have been uh, examples through history, and I've even uh, seen a little bit of it in the Greek Orthodox Church growing up, where, you know, faith is not what it could be, uh, what you've experienced, what I've experienced. It really is a kind of a way, it, it just becomes part of a larger power structure, maybe not meant to subjugate uh, uh, people, mm -hmm. but in some ways ha having that effect. So I just want to be clear that, you know, some sure. religion has functioned in a way to allow people like Marx to tag it that way. But you and I know that most of it doesn't function that way, so he's wrong to tag it that way. Well, I think... If you talk to any priest or pastor or, per, or someone who leads a church, there's going to be people for whom their faith makes them passive and not take on their freedom. But what I think is a little difficult is that when someone's doing serious philosophy, to go from that observation to a generalization to all religion and all time is a, is a huge jump in logic. Correct. And it's not very scientific. Correct. Um, and so it becomes, instead of something that's being argued for, it becomes a presupposition, right? And so what I think has happened with often when people don't read the full marks or don't think very carefully, they just come when they remember this one phrase that religion is the opiate of the people and they just don't think very nuanced. But when I went to Haiti for the first time, it was in the year 2001 and I was doing field work for my dissertation, which was on immigration from Haiti in the United States. And I was, I learned Haitian Creole, spending time in Haiti, but I was actually, I got a phone call um, telling me that my father was undergoing surgery and might not survive that night. And I had to leave Haiti. Um, and I'll never forget the fear I was in, the fear that my father might die before I got home. And I had to get to the, order, to the airport in Port-au-Prince, beg my way onto the next flight to Miami. And then I made the decision to spend the night in Miami thinking I had time to make it to Washington. And I get another phone call saying my father could die in the next few hours. And I felt terribly guilty that I wasn't there. And I threw myself down on the ground in my in the bedroom of my aunt's house where I had slept, I don't know, every summer of my life. In Miami. In Miami. And I grabbed a rosary and I started praying to God to have mercy on my father's soul. I was sobbing, hysterically sobbing, saying goodbye to my father. And suddenly I looked up and this picture of Jesus on the wall standing behind the the timon, I'm thinking in Spanish now, the steering wheel of a boat. Um, and it was like lit up. And I had this feeling that like Jesus is in control. I'm on this boat and it's sinking. So this was, an, Jesus actual, in control. This was an actual picture. Yeah. But, it, but somehow, mystically, it came to yeah. life. And all I could do was stare at it. And it, it calmed me down. My father survived that night. I made it to his bedside to say goodbye. But he died three weeks later. 
And the morning after he died, I drove my brother to Washington Reagan National Airport and passed out asleep at 8 a.m. thinking I could finally get some sleep. And I woke up at 12 noon to multiple messages on my phone, home phone, cell phone, my mother and my brother downstairs. And my brother says to me, do you know what happened today? And I said, no. And he said, a plane hit the World Trade Center. Then another plane hit the World Trade Center. They both fell down. Another plane hit the Pentagon. And a fourth plane went down in Pennsylvania. It was 9-11. And I slept through it because I finally thought I was gonna rest. And I couldn't cry, I had no tears left. I went upstairs and I shut the door and I put a pillow on my head and I didn't want to face the world. And I went into a serious depression. And when you go through a personal loss like that, followed by 9-11, yeah. all of these questions are racing through your head. Like, why does God let people in Haiti suffer? Why did God take my father? Why I mean, did God let of, all these people die? The Existential despair. H hang on, Margarita. We're going to go to a, a yet another break. Uh, such an important conversation. Folks, don't go away. It's the Eric Taxa Show. We'll be right back. Rita Mooney, Ph.D., uh, I like saying that. She's the associate professor, an associate professor of practical theology at Princeton Theological Seminary, executive director of the Scala Foundation. You can go to scalafoundation.org. Margarita, you were just telling us about this horrific moment. Your father has just died. You think you can get some peace now because that's over. You sleep till noon and you wake up and you realize everybody is telling you, didn't you hear what just happened? Didn't you hear what just happened? And you realize that planes have crashed into the World Trade Center, thousands of people have died, the Pentagon has been hit, and you can deal with it all. Oh, no. And I couldn't get away from it either because my father was a New Yorker. He grew up in New York. He went to high school down the street from the studio. He went to Xavier High School right over here. I look, his mouse pad, the World Trade Center, his screensaver, the World Trade Center. He had 1976 King Kong poster standing on top of the World Are Trade you Center. Kidding? So I just go up to my room and I stick a pillow over my head and I don't want to come out. And I think I was depressed. I mean, I couldn't somehow couldn't figure out how to put a stamp on an envelope to pay my credit card bill. Um, I couldn't figure out how I was gonna go back to Miami and pick up my car. I mean, I couldn't do anything for about a month. Um, and fortunately, some mentors told me to just take it easy and try to recover. And after about a month, I began to do things. But there was a month where I couldn't really function. And you were, were, you were a, a grad student? I was a grad student in sociology. At Princeton yes. at that time. And this is before you go up to Yale. Yale was my undergraduate. I had been through Yale and then went right. to Princeton grad school and then returned to Yale. Right. But I did make the decision to go back to my field work in Haiti. And what happened then, I went back to the Haitian community of Miami. And then I also went with a Catholic group to Haiti. And when I went back to my dissertation work, I was still a graduate student in sociology, but I was a really different person. I was hurting, deeply hurting inside. And so when I went to the church where I was doing my field work, I'll never forget this. I still had this framework in my head that poor people go to church because it helps them get material things that they wouldn't otherwise have. And I remember asking this woman, I, was, I spoke Haitian Creole, and I asked her, you know, I've seen you in church all the time. Why do you come so often? And she looked at me and she said, because I love God. And in my head, I'm thinking, you know, she needs this or she needs that or whatever. And someone else said to me, and I write about all this in my book, Faith Makes Us Live. This other woman said to me, well, yeah, every time God answers my prayers, 10 more problems come along. Plus, whoever said you're supposed to ask God for things for yourself? I mean, that's kind of selfish. When I pray, the thing I do the most is give God thanks. And I began to realize that these people who probably genuinely didn't have enough food on their table were more generous than me. They didn't have enough food on their table, but they'd give other people their food before they ate it themselves. These people who really needed help, wouldn't pray for themselves first. And I realized I prayed mostly for things I wanted for myself. And I felt so silly and I felt so selfish. And then I got on a plane and I went back to Haiti and going back there because I had been there when I got the call to come back because my father was dying, it was very emotional for me. And what I realized 
sitting with a group of people who participated in a church cooperative. Again, once again, here I am, the sociologist, ethnographer, I'm so cool, I'm speaking Haitian Creole, and I'm asking these people about all the financial benefits they get from their cooperative. And this Haitian guy sitting next to me, who's studying to become a priest, he says to me in English, why don't you ask him what it means to them? And this woman, she said, oh, God is so good. God is with me all the time. And God just gives me so many gifts and I give God so much thanks and God has done so many miracles for me. God brought you here to be with me today. And what I realized was that it wasn't so much that people in Haiti see God acting in this kind of supernatural way that breaks with the laws of nature more than they see all of the good that can happen is a gift from God. They see me as a gift from God, my presence there. They didn't see me through the lens of my skin color and tell me I was a white woman with privilege because they don't see that. What they see, they see a woman who's interacting with them. They see me and they see the image of God in me. Did, did you write about this? You said in a book, Faith Makes Us Live. Yes, Faith Makes Us Live, Surviving and Thriving in the Haitian Diaspora. When did when did that book come out? 2009. Sur okay, Faith Makes Us Live by Margarita Mooney is available. Yes. Faith, do you have other books that you've written? That's the main one that's based on ethnographic work. I've also written on my blog on margaritamooney.com. You can search for, for articles on Haiti or Haitian Catholicism because I published an article in the Miami Herald and also a blog after the Haitian earthquake, right? And an um, image really struck me after the Haitian earthquake. In 2004, the cathedral of Port-au-Prince collapsed, but there was a giant cross left and a priest was out there saying mass and people gathered in the midst of rubble to give thanks for God. And people said, oh, you know, they're running from their problems. And I said, no, they have a sacramental and a sacred imagination that out of this rubble, God can still act. And if you don't recognize that people see God can act and bring good out of this rubble, then you've reduced them to nothing but a material thing. Well, but isn't that the point? Western white materialists do not get this and they somewhat racist uh, in their views look down on people like these Haitians. They, they, they really think they like, oh. They don't see that as agency because agency is manipulation, is getting, it's an instrumental view of human action rather than a constitutive or a purpose-filled or a vocation-filled or a mission-filled view of agency. And to the idea that in the midst of tragedy, you give thanks to God, it is kind of shocking. You have to think about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, look, it's not exactly normative in the materialist West in which we live. Let's face it, 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 it a lot of people not what? only don't, aren't they comfortable with it, they sneer at it or they're disgusted by it. They think, what, what kind of brainwashed people, what is wrong with you, you know, and they can't, they can't understand that. Um, we're going to continue the conversation with you. Uh, you were starting to sound like a sociologist and then I realized, hey, you are a sociologist. Um, I, I want to come back uh, uh, to talk more with you, Margarita about uh, the book that you're working on. You touched on it, the, this uh, encounter with an angel. Um, folks, it's the Eric Metaxas Show. Whatever you do, don't touch that dial. I'm Margarita Mooney. Margarita, we've just got uh, a couple of minutes left in this hour, but we're going to lock the doors and keep you here uh, <laughs> to continue the conversation. But you just wanted to share a story you said uh, before we go to our break. Yeah, when I was talking about my time in Haiti and how it seems paradoxical that people give thanks to God in the midst of tragedy, I think often the response we think people should go out and uh, fight the revolution or the only way to use their agency is to exercise their critical consciousness to change the world. And that point was hit home to me when I was in Cuba. I went to Cuba seven times between 1994 and 2007. And on my last trip there, I was on my way to the airport and I had spent a lot of time in my last few trips there with a friend who was a medical doctor who was not raised in the faith but had walked into a Catholic church one day and become a Catholic in Cuba in a very hostile environment, a man of a lot of integrity. And as he was driving me to the airport, right, I, I just went on this rant about what an evil totalitarian system this was and why didn't people rise up and why didn't people fight and, you know, people should be fighting back against this. And he looked at me and he just called me out and he said, you know what, Margarita, you're going to hop on a plane and in Miami 
an hour from now, you're going to be taking a hot shower and eating a hot plate of food. And you know what? I can't do that. But God's given me a mission. I may not have all the stuff that you have, and I may not be able you know, be able to fight for the change that you think I should do. But after I drop you off, I'm going to go visit the grandmother down the street from me who nobody visits and she doesn't have faith. This is where God put me. And my mission is right here, right now. And what I feel often is that in the intellectual circles I run in, we exalt the intellect and our critical consciousness to think about change and to tell other people how to change. But then when we see people like my friend in Cuba or my friends in Haiti, giving thanks to God and doing small acts of service in the midst of really tough situations, we look down on them. But yet we're sitting there with hot showers and hot food and hot lattes pontificating. And the reality is real change is really hard work. And I left Cuba and Haiti oftentimes in fear and in frustration and in anger at how little I could do. And that was my pride. And I didn't have the courage of the people I met in Haiti and Cuba who were willing to stand in the middle of these horrific and difficult situations with confidence that God had given them a mission. That's the difference to me, right? In other words, it's like you're seeing with the eyes of man and, you know, Jesus rebukes Peter when Peter says, no, Lord, you can't go to the cross. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, you know, you're, we have to see with God's eyes and these people are seeing with God's eyes. What is God calling me to do today? Oftentimes it's very different from what an impatient, frustrated American would think that they must do. We have to go to a break. Margarita Mooney, don't go away. Uh, in hour two, we'll continue the conversation with you. And I want to talk to you about the book that you are, uh, talking about writing next folks It's the Eric Metaxas show. Stick around. And I continue my conversation with Margarita Mooney of Princeton Theological Seminary. Margarita, you, the last time you were on this program, and I want to encourage people, in case they missed your previous appearance on this program, they can go uh, to my YouTube channel, Eric Metaxas Show, because you really give a lot of background on how you got to where you are. But I want to talk a little bit about your uh, your future here. You are uh, working on a book proposal called Angels and Other Gifts Moving from fear to hope. And we kind of thought it would be fun to to talk about that idea. Yeah, the book that I want to write, Angels and Other Gifts, Moving from Fear to Hope, as I've shared on the show today, I've often identified or been identified for being an intellectual. And I haven't always shared some of these deeper stories that really, in my own personal life, some of the fears and um, feeling depressed after my father died or fear of death, fear of my friend's death, and realizing that in some of my worst moments these that this supernatural presence is really with me and how strong that is. And in the work I do with young people at Princeton or through Scala Foundation, I think we live in a time of a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety and a lot of desire for control. And I think behind that is a deeper problem where the reason when people go to some place like Haiti where there's a lot of material poverty but they come back filled with the spirit is because people live as if every moment of life is a gift and I think my encounters with angels that I've described today and my time working with people truly in abject poverty have taught me that When you see that your life is a gift and you accept your dependence on a creator, then you see that miracles can happen. Whether those miracles be one understanding of miracle is a supernatural intervention that changes things. But another miracle is just when you think about life as a gift, you're able to rejoice in the midst of suffering. And when you do that, I believe your intellect and your mind opens up and your curiosity, your ability to, to, to see your way out of a problem strengthens. When you accept that life is a gift, then you begin to see other people differently. You see other people, not as some kind of mechanical solidarity that's going to help you get something for yourself, but as a gift that God gave you right now to be with you. And what I think, instead of looking at life as a project or a set of goals to be able What does it mean to live life when you're actually present to the gifts that God's trying to bring into your life at every moment? You rejoice, you take yourself a little bit more lightly, which I've been told to do many times. I take myself rather seriously and it's kind of exhausting. 
<laughs> um, and I see students who are like me when I was in the Ivy League thinking that my identity is grounded on my achievements. Yeah. But when your identity is grounded in this idea that life is a gift, then that makes you want to rejoice and give thanks to your creator and accept your dependence on the creator. And that is where freedom comes. I was going to say, frankly, that's the only way to fly. And God, in his love for us, tries to communicate that as strongly as possible in the scripture. I mean, when, when the scripture says, rejoice in the Lord always, again, I say rejoice. He doesn't say rejoice if things are great. It's not about no. happiness. It's not no. about having everything you want. It's about in the midst of whatever you are, mm -hmm. look to God and have joy in him. And somehow uh, he seems to be suggesting pretty clearly that not only is that possible, mm -hmm. But that is the only way to live. When we talk about joy, it's very different from happiness. Happiness, I mean, the root for happiness is hap or happenstance when something happens. Uh, so you say, if I can only get this to happen this way and this to happen this way, then I will be happy. I will be lucky. I will be. And God says, no, wrong. In the midst of whatever happens, you can have joy if it's based on me. And it's a dramatically different. It, this is one of the great tragedies of, uh, you know, the, 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 the sure. framers when they say li life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Frankly, uh, it's a pity that they put it that way. But uh, we really need to understand there's a big difference between happiness and joy. And you can live in penury uh, in Haiti and still have joy. Uh, and you can live in material wealth in America and not have joy and, uh, you know, have happiness and no joy, which there's an irony there. <sighs> And I think behind part of the problem that I see is that we live in an era in, in the West where we've exalted a kind of secular humanism. And I'm a humanist, but I'm really an integral humanist or a Christian humanist. When we want to exalt the powers of our humanity or the powers of the self apart from the idea of a creator God upon whom we're dependent, we end up elevating the self. So I think, as I was saying before, even my own Catholicism is very American in the sense where we just tend to think that the world begins and ends with us and we're at the center of everything and our actions and our decisions are at the center of everything. But thinking that your life is a gift and that every moment is a gift radically changes your perspective. Yeah. So what kinds of communities could we form if we accepted this idea that life is a gift. And I love this book by Jean Vanier, the founder of L'Arche Movement, Community and Growth. Right? Um, and he founded a movement of homes of people who lived with the disabled. And it can be challenging to see a disabled person or a weak person as a gift. But what he really emphasized was that it's the sick and the suffering who are blessing us through their suffering rather than us serving them or helping them. Now that's a, it's a difficult thing to see, but one strange way maybe that I practiced this when my friend John was in the hospital and he was dying and I couldn't see him, I was just wandering around Manhattan hoping he would call and I could go to the hospital, but instead I would stop and talk to the homeless people. And people who are homeless don't often look beautiful or smell beautiful, but because I was so worried about my friend John, I was able to see in them the image of God and they were incredibly friendly. And I told them about my friend John and we prayed together on the streets of Manhattan. And I realized that the homeless are a gift amongst us because they, they're carrying the image of God in them. That's what makes any life sacred, not our achievements and not our worthiness. So Jean Vanier, I think, has created communities like this. What would it be like to create educational communities where we see other people around us as a gift? Hey, we're going to have difficulties. We're going to have disagreements. We're going to have conflict. But that person across the table from me is a, is a gift from God that needs to be respected in their, in their dignity. What would family life be like if we looked at our families as this incredible gift, which in fact they are? rather than as, you know, a way to, sometimes we describe marriage as if it's going to be the way that's going to get us our perfect happiness. And, eh, you know, no community and no marriage is ever going to get perfect contentment all the time. There's going to be struggle and there's going to be conflict. But those people are there in our lives to help us on our journeys to God. I mean, it's such a radically different way of seeing the world. And of course, that is uh, the biblical way of, of, of seeing the world. I find it interesting, you know, you mentioned before that you have a very 
tendency toward a very American Catholicism. And I, I think that's the case that in, in the West, in the materialist West, many people who call themselves Christians still see the world uh, in non-Christian categories. They haven't really redeemed their whole mind to see that they're they're not uh, in control. They're not, you know, the, or, or the fact that they're not themselves being consistent in the in the way that they operate. And it's important that we're reminded about these things. I know Bonhoeffer when he visited a place called Bielefeld, which was a a community kind of like uh, the Vanier communities, where Christians were caring for all kinds of disabled people, and it was the antithesis of the Nazi death camp worldview, where it's all about this Nietzschean, you know, the ubermensch, the str- strength is everything. And here he said, no, 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 God's economy, weakness is everything. Absolutely. Because this is where I see truth. This is where I see God. And that that really does challenge us, it's let's be honest. True. Along those lines, Eric, I teach classes in sociology and theology where I teach virtue ethics. And the concept of virtue, you know, dates back to Aristotle. But really, in the Aristotelian world, the highest virtue was was courage. And the hero was the warrior. And in Christianity, that's not the case, right? There's this really important component of humility that comes from dependence on God and mercy. Mercy for the weak, right? And I, I just think that the idea that God became man. Um, again, Christ was man, but he was also divine, right? So the whole idea that the divinity can enter into our humanity, yeah, it's a pretty radical idea, but it's important. It's an important one to contend with. And before just brushing that off as impossible, you know, think about it, right? Contend with it. What does that actually mean? That God became a man, right? The divine became human. So what I've come to see that a a different way of understanding humanism, right? This integral humanism or this Christian humanism certainly sees all the good that's in us, but we do need to be redeemed. Hang on. This is too important a point. We're going to go to a break. We're going to come back and... uh encourage you to flesh that out. Folks, talking to Margarita Mooney, don't go away. Folks, we're talking to Margarita Mooney. Just a few minutes left. Margarita, you're just making such an important point. You talked about the virtue of courage and the warrior, and then you say the Christian virtue is a virtue of humility and faith. And I thought to myself, Jesus really sums up both. In other words, he gives us the courage, like my hero Dietrich Bonhoeffer, too. The courage to have faith when people are telling you, shut up, your version of things, we're not interested in your version of things, we're not interested in your weakness, we're not interested, we have this other view. And so in a sense, the greatest courage, the greatest heroism can be the humility that says, I put my trust in God, I live for God, I live for other people because he calls me to live for that. That in in, in the, the time in which we live today, that kind of courage uh, is is the kind that we need, but it is different from the Absolutely. you know the classical version of courage. Absolutely. But, but you were just going to talk about uh, in the few minutes left Look, m- a little bit more about this book idea. Sure. Well, listen, let me talk first a little bit about my teaching and how that's led me into my own book. But one of the authors that I just have to find a way to work into every class I ever teach is Alasdair McIntyre. His book, After Virtue, which came out in 1981, he wrote while still an atheist Marxist philosopher. And what he was arguing was that modern philosophy couldn't really come to an understanding of the virtues that would build the common good because it was ultimately we had lost any sense of tradition or any sense of community or any sense of transcendent truth. When people read that now, they think he was writing it as a Christian, but it wasn't. It was the dead end of philosophy that led him to read Thomas Aquinas and then become a Christian. And after he became a Christian, he wrote a fantastic book, Dependent Rational Animals, in which he argues the point that I just said, that Christianity brings in a different set of virtues that you're not going to get from Aristotle, beginning with humility and mercy. And so in the book that I'm writing, I'm trying to work out, let's say, from the examples I've seen in my own life and the people I've interviewed, what does it look like to build communities that are founded on this idea of what McIntyre calls acknowledged dependence and vulnerability? How does that change the way that we relate to each other? How does that change the way that we think about family and community when our starting point is the virtues of acknowledged dependence? And those virtues are mercy, 
forgiveness, humility. And what I've seen, why I find this so interesting is that in my ethnographic work, when I interview people, people who've never read McIntyre, never will, may not call themselves Christian, people are running into a dead end that when their relationships are founded on this idea of mutual exchange, it doesn't get them very far. No, no. Relationships it's, it's, founded on uncalculated giving and receiving. Right. What does that look like? Uncalculated. Okay, when I'm giving away to charity, I'm calculating in my head what percentage of my income is this and how close, and how close am I to my goal. Listen, the people in the pews and the Catholic Church in Haiti, they're not calculating how much is going to hurt them to give away the money they're giving away. They're giving, and they're not calculating. We're always calculating. Uncalculated giving and receiving. Unconditional love. And what is it like to build intimate relationships and communities on the virtues of unconditional love, mercy, and forgiveness. And I would start with marriage and the family. In other words, somebody who's been married 23 years, I can say that that's the only way that it works. Uh, if it's about, you know, realizing my potential and finding somebody who's going to help me to be the greatest me possible and who's going to complete me, it becomes all about me, and it's bound to fail because you're both fallen sinners with error Look, with issues and things. And if you can't love and forgive, it's just bound to fail. Look, Eric, what you just described, I think sadly is an example how even in many Christian communities, the way we talk about marriage has fallen into this therapeutic idea that it's all about me. And it's all about what this marriage is gonna do for me. Um, what I would say is that there's a whole different way of thinking about our relationships to other people. Again, beginning with this idea that the existence of every person is a gift and that we're mutually dependent on God for our existence and our being. And we're mutually helping each other on this, on this journey. Now, when people start to think about this, that everyone's a gift, that we're both equally dependent on God. Again, my favorite authors, people like uh, Jean Vanier and Jacques Maritain make this point that the real meaning of community and solidarity is never to turn the individual into a means for some communal goal, right? Community, family, marriage, exist to help us on our path towards God. And there's a part of our soul that is between us and God and it's irreducible. Now the forms of community I saw in communism, get rid of that because they get rid of the image of God and the soul. And when the person is nothing but a piece in a social machine or nothing but an expression of a social identity and you've lost that idea of the image of God, community, marriage, neighborhood can become very oppressive really fast, which is why most experiments in living called intentional communities don't work very well because they end up squashing the individual. But when, it, when community and marriage is founded on a mutual acknowledgement of dependence and the sinful part of our human nature, then you have to talk about how do we resolve conflicts in peace? How do we forgive? How do we look at others with mercy? And in these very divisive times when fallenness and brokenness is often met with self-righteous resentment or anger, I think we need to rethink the very fundamental under question of what it is to be a person. Do we, do we have time for one more segment, Albin? I was going to say, Margarita, because I, I want to continue along these lines. We're going to go to a break. Uh, stick around, folks, for a, another segment with Margarita Mooney. You can find her at margaritamooney.com or scalafoundation.org. We'll be right back. Hey there, folks. It's the Eric from Texas Show. I'm talking to Margarita Mooney. She is the, uh, she's a, an associate professor of practical theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. She's the executive director of the Scala Foundation. Uh, we should talk a little bit about Marxism in the academy. Uh, we just have a few minutes, but it's an important subject. There's a book called The Crisis of Modernity by Augusto Del Noche, and part of what he argues, in particular in the United States, we like to think that Marxism hasn't influenced us because we don't, because we've never had a strong socialist or communist party, maybe not up until now. But Del, Del Noche's main point is that actually Marxism triumphed culturally in Western Europe and in the United States. How so? Well, look, this is a fact, and I'm so glad you're talking about this. Please, go ahead. And so what Del Noche says is that what we've got in our culture in Western Europe and in the United States is actually a kind of cultural Marxism. Yes. Where 
are very understanding where there's no understanding of the symbolic realm or meaning having a transcendent dimension. So the philosophical Marxism that Del Noche is talking about is the death of the transcendence, the death of the sacred. And in many ways, as I said earlier, my Catholicism is very American. I would say a lot of Christianity is very American in the sense that there's a strong strand of pragmatism what works, what can we do now, what can we change? That's very deep in American culture. And look, there's something good about that. I like things that work. I like that things in America work. But we've deadened down, and I see this in education because it's the field that I work in. As I said at the start of the show, it's my mission. God gave me this mission in education, and I thought I was meant to go do something grander than be a professor. But my mission in education has been to try to bring back this contemplative side of the person that looks at the world and certainly wants to study biological science or engineering science because we want to know how things work in nature. That's great. But also wants to have a sense of mystery and wonder and curiosity at the laws of nature, right? That's another way of thinking about, it's miraculous just to think that the human body works how it works. And the fact that you can explain it through biology doesn't mean that it's any less miraculous. Well, anybody who has a real sense of science and math knows that it doesn't make any rational sense that the universe is understandable. It doesn't make any rational sense that we can describe uh, everything through physics and mathematics. I mean, those things alone are occasion for wonderment. And, sure. and again, you can skip it, but why? Like, why not appreciate that all of these things are sure. wonderful in the literal sense? So what I see in so much of education is that we've lost our understanding of the human person having a contemplative side. And that that contemplative side of us isn't just kind of re resting our mind, it's actually exercising our mind to the receptivity of truth and to a wonder about the truth. We've forgotten the intrinsic relationship between beauty and truth. We're not only meant to know the truth, we're meant to love the truth. And in the programs that I do through Scala, when I give them, for example, Jean Leclerc, love of learning and the desire for God, and contrast that with other theories of education, students love the ideas of medieval monks reading poetry just for the fun of it because it's beautiful and that that's a way of exercising their their capacities because somehow poetry reflects the image of God and guess what so does nature the laws of nature are also reflecting the grandeur of God so when students see this older kind of medieval understanding of education whether it's poetry or biology that both are reflecting God's grandeur and beauty. It puts back in them what they had almost inevitably as five-year-olds, an excitement about learning, a desire to know things. And I think, look, we need to make the case that uh, this is not some atavistic thing. This is not some uh, anachronistic thing. This is appropriate. The more we learn uh, in the West, the more it points us to this idea of a holistic view of the human person, a wonder uh, at the universe, Th that's to me what all of knowledge leads to inevitably. And so if, if that's where science is taking us, why do we kick against the goads and say, no, 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 I still want to leave live in a reductionist universe where you're just a bunch of atoms or, or in other words, that view, which maybe made some intellectual sense a hundred years ago, it makes very little sense. But there are very few people who have the courage to see that the transcendent, uh, and that the, the transcendent is the enemy of this reductionist view of the human person, that that really, we're, <laughs> we're coming to a place where all of these academic disciplines, if anything, are pointing toward that, toward the biblical view of the human person, not toward this reductionist view. Well, look, Eric, I think the tide is shifting. There's a movement to reinvigorate classical liberal arts education founded on Christian anthropology with a deep emphasis on the relationship between beauty and truth. I think a lot of times in the United States, we want to think that our freedom comes through our political institutions or our economic freedom. But everywhere and always, totalitarian regimes have tried to turn education into a tool of the state. And education has got to be founded on a robust 
vast notion of freedom and a cultural freedom, a freedom that's grounded in the image of God and gives people back the sense of joy and excitement about learning that leads to a freedom that, as I've been emphasizing during this show, is mission-oriented, that the gifts we've been given and the knowledge that we have are meant to serve a higher purpose. And when you do that, believe me, people are transformed and they are ready. They're ready to go out on their mission and they're ready to serve others and use their gifts in a way that builds up the common good. And that's something that education needs to be focused on forming the entire human person understood as having the image of God in them with the capacity to know and understand the material world, but that ultimately everything in the material world is a sign of the grandeur of God upon whom we depend for every single breath. And we will leave it there. My goodness, Margarita Mooney, I'm so grateful, uh, not just that you're here in the studio, but that you're at Princeton Theological Seminary. We need uh, people like you in the Academy willing to go where the evidence points. Uh, thank you so much. Thank